interesting. Well, good afternoon, y'all. We're going to go ahead and get started. Just so you know, um, this session is one of the three sessions that's being streamed live via YouTube. So, how do YouTube folks? Uh, uh, we're trying this out to see if this is going to be something that we want to do uh, on a regular basis um, to see how this works. We're using Google Hangout um, as, as a way to, to do that. So it's being streamed via YouTube through Google Hangout on air. You can actually do any of um, the things that I'm doing. You can broadcast your, your events at your own school live using this, this technique. It's free, um, and you can get as simple or as advanced as you want to get with it. Um, we're using a MacBook and with a, a, a camera on it. You can use a Chromebook with a camera on it. You can use your iPhone. Um, Anything that has a camera on it that will connect to the internet, you can you can do it, or you can go as high tech as plugging in the you know the the video cameras that are designed to do that and stream them that way. So this is super easy, super cheap. Um, also, too, I'm using um, a, a little app um, called um, My Point, and what it is is it connects my smartphone to my laptop and allows me to control it. Um, and the great thing about it is, is that I can see the presentation on here. I can see the slide that's coming next. If I put notes on the slide, um, I can see those pop up as well. Um, the one trick <clears throat> so far has been my videos, trying to get them to, to load up um, and, and manipulate them, and that hasn't been as easy. So my point. No, it's free. Um, you download the app on your phone, and then you download the companion app on any device that you want. Um, I do lots of presentations at conferences, and I use this one. I downloaded it on the computer right before the, the presentation. It wasn't even my computer, but I was able to find it and connect it. So it's just something really cool to check out. Makes presentation a lot easier for me because uh, I get nervous and forget what I'm talking about, that kind of stuff. So um, anyway, the presentation that we're doing today, we are talking about uh, easy data and differentiation. Um, and differentiation is not just for educators. We differentiate our lives. Um, this image is from the airport, uh, and this is the, the TSA line. And so you see there, you know, which one are you? Are you a family? You know, do you have medical liquids, strollers, those kind of things? Are you a casual tra traveler? Or are you an expert traveler? And they help help you see which direction to go in order to get uh, to make it easier for everybody. Now, it may take the family a little longer to go through, but as long as you don't have the expert travelers backing up on the families, everybody's happy. They do get aggravated. Yes. Uh, and, and, and rightly so. If you spent a lot of time in an airport, the things that frustrate you uh, were probably, well, it would be families is what it would be. Uh, <clears throat> but when I'm, I'm working with teachers, training teachers on differentiation, one of the things I get from them all the time is that, you know, they, they don't see how to do it, why they should do it, or, or um, and the other part we've been talking a lot about is convincing the administrators that you are doing it and how to show it in the classroom. So we're going to talk about all these things today. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that your definition of uh, um, what differentiation is matches at least some of these. Um, it, it, number one, it should be responding to student needs. And let me be very clear, sometimes students don't need differentiation. Okay? You do not have to do differentiation all day, every day. But you should do it and do it often. It should be something that is common in your classroom so that when the administrator does walk in and you say, okay, get in your, you know, B groups, and the kids are all looking at each other like, B group, right? What the heck is that? <clears throat> that's where the, that's what the administrators are looking for. Is to see that the kids know, you know, where they are, or they know that you've got the, the, the key ring hanging on the wall with their names on it, and that you're flipping through those 
you know, all of those differentiation grouping strategies, those are the kind of things that administrators are going to look for to see it. And they're going to look in your lesson plans. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, that is data driven, which is the piece that I'm sharing with you today. Uh, we're going to focus on, on the data and we're going to focus on finding the right tools to make it easier for you to do the data and the differentiation. Okay? It's easy, I swear. I ain't lying. I put it up there and write it. Okay, this is not differentiation. Um, and this is um, an infographic. Um, you can create these yourself. I will tell you that they are extremely time consuming to create. I did not create this one, I stole it. Okay? And you can all join me in copyright hell. All right? <laughs> With this, though, uh, infographics are fantastic things for those students to create who are already done with everything, you know, the ones that drive you nuts because they get finished with everything and, and they're detail oriented and you know, all of that type of stuff. Those are the types of students who can create infographics for you for your classroom. Okay, so maybe you got the classroom project where you're collecting a whole lot of data or those kind of things. Um, they can make infographics in their websites, free websites where you can go and create them. You can create them in, in pages. Uh, um, you can even create them in Word and things like that. Um, but creating an infographic is a great activity to summarize the, the, like the sum of all wisdom for your classroom for a particular topic. Okay? Maybe, you, maybe you create an infographic um, at the beginning with their knowledge, where, where we are, their, their pre-knowledge. You pre-assess them. You put that up there. Then you create another infographic at the end to see if, if there were any changes. Okay? So like, you know, we might do that with you in here today, and I might say, okay, what is differentiation? And you don't know anything about differentiation, so you tell me all of these things. Right? And then we say, okay, now we've learned about differentiation. This, how does this look? Let's compare the two. Do you see what I'm saying? All right? The infographics are fantastic um, little things. They're visual. Uh, um, and it's, it's a whole lot of fun to put those together, but they are extremely time consuming. So that's one of those things that you give the kids, you know, they can do it for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for me, though, the, the hardest part about differentiation is planning. That's the piece that I struggle with. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is, is I increase the amount of technology in my life. It makes my life uh, easier to manage. Uh, I'm, I, I can... Um, multitask, do, do multiple things, I can be more efficient, but uh, me being a procrastinator, um, that allows me to procrastinate more than I probably should, okay? Uh, and planning is one of the places where I procrastinate a whole lot on, okay? Now, it turns out that, you know, I'm, I have some talent and I can do some things, you know, pulling them out of thin air, um, but because we're on YouTube, I'm not going to say what I really wanted to say with that one, but... Planning is the one that, that you have to be you have to do with differentiation. You can't do it on the fly, and, and so it does take a conscious effort to pull off. Um, the other stuff, the idea about teaching up, that's one that teachers get confused about with differentiation, is they think that they have to dumb things down for the students, and that's not it at all. Um, that you can all do things, do the same things, but you're doing things at different levels. Uh, um, that, that make a whole lot of sense. And let, I'll, I'll try to give you an example of that. Um, one of my friends, she's a science coordinator for Cobb County, and she had a list of um, symbols. There were arrows. And so, you know, one arrow was pointing left, one arrow was pointing up, one arrow was pointing right, and one arrow was pointing down. And she said the level one would be everyone say the direction of the arrow. Yeah, left, up, right down. Level two would be now say, okay, uh, you say the direction of the arrow and move your head in the direction of the arrow. So you know, left, up, right, down. Level three is where you say the direction of the arrow and you move your head in the opposite direction. Do You see what I'm getting at? We're all focused on the same standard, the same thing, but we're all getting there a little bit different way. Okay? I thought that was a good example. That one clicked with me. It may not click with you, but I thought that one was a good one. 
All right, so the number one thing that you have to do in uh, um, differentiation is you have to know where your students are. Before we can differentiate at all, you can't just assume that you know about your kids. Um, elementary school teachers, you do a phenomenal job of knowing your students. Um, at the end of the year, you can tell me just about everything there is to know about your students because you spend so much time with them. I mean, you know, everything from, you can probably tell me what little Johnny had for lunch, you know, by the end of the year. Do, do you know what I mean? I, I mean, you guys know your kids. And what I find with elementary teachers is that because you know your kids, you start to assume things about them, you know, because you get comfortable, oh, Johnny's not going to be able to do this one, so I need to give him blah, 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 blah. Well, what I want you to be careful of is that assumption that's not backed up by the data, okay? Middle and high school folks, because you have so many more students that you deal with, and you don't deal with them as long, you know, at a stretch, you, you tend to rely more on data, uh, and, and that, that's a good thing. My problem is, is that sometimes th that the middle and high school teachers don't spend enough time collecting quality data from them. They give, you know, will give one, pretest and say that's it. Never stop to t test along the way or that they, you know, they do it per per chapter or per unit or whatever that it needs to be more ongoing. Okay? We all have our strengths. Okay? And we're all amazing people. I, I don't want you leaving here thinking that you know, you're not doing something that you're supposed to do. This is hard. Okay? But we want to get better. Okay? Um, <clears throat> knowing where your kids are allows you to do a pre rather than post mortem. In my classroom, when I left the classroom eight years ago, um, the only feedback that the kids got from me other than verbal feedback was the grade at the top of the paper, right? Um, I didn't really, I couldn't tell you where the kids were. I would look at things like I taught AP chemistry. I would look at the data that I got from the students in the summer after they took the test. And then I would use that data to make changes for the next year when I had a totally different set of kids. That's a problem, right? So as much as the SLOs, SGAs, whatever you want to call them, are, are kind of a dirty word, I do think that one of the things that is coming out of that is allowing us to get some, some data from that. Um, benchmarks, you know, depending on where you are and, and what you're doing. But that pre-data is, to my mind, more important than the post. Okay, because if you don't know where they are when they come into your classroom, you know, how in the world are you going to move them? All right, it also allows you to engage your students more easily. It allows you to compact the curriculum, skip over the stuff that they know, and get to the stuff that they don't. The one complaint that I get from teachers all the time is that I don't have enough time to do all of this stuff. I get it. Well, if the kids already know how to do Basic multiplication, why are you going to spend more time making them memorize the multiplication table? Compact the curriculum. Teach the things that they need to know. People say, well, I have to cover all of these standards. No, don't cover them. Teach the kids what they need to know. Teach them what they don't know. Don't reteach what somebody else has taught. Especially, you know, you guys know, you've got that teacher that is before you on the continuum. You know, they're the, the grade before you or, or the, the, you know, the biology teacher and, 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 you, you got the chemistry kids the next year. You guys know that those kids all know how to do a graph, right? Or they all know how to, well, okay, so I'm making stuff up here. But, but, but you know what I'm talking about. But you guys all know that you have teachers. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, it, is, it is dangerous to assume. But you guys know what I'm talking about, that, that you have folks in your building who get your, your kids before you do, and that they have their strengths. And that those kids are going to know that one particular thing, you know, whatever it is, and they're going to know it well. Don't spend any time on that, right? Move on. That's what we're after with this. It, if you're skipping the stuff that they already know, they're going to be less likely to be bored. I'm not saying this is the magic bullet because there are no magic bullets in education. But this will allow you to, to move on more quickly. Yes, ma'am? How much time do you spend on pre-assessments when... The subject matter that one teaches, there's never been any material on it prior to this class. Uh, the, 
That is a great question. Okay, and the question for the folks out on YouTube who may not have heard that was how much time do you spend on pre-assessments when there's no guarantee that the students will have come into anything prior? So uh, and in the case of, of your class, I know you teach talking about human anatomy. Okay, so there is no middle school human anatomy class, right? However, they, that doesn't mean that they don't haven't had some experience with it. And in that means in fifth grade when they're talking about you know cells and, and body tissues and things like that, seventh grade when they're doing the life science and, and all of that type of stuff, they've run into some of the concepts that you're going to be teaching them. They have formed, in some cases, misconceptions about those. So absolutely. I would say that in your case, with that particular class, you, it is super important that you do a really good job pre-assessing. The, the neuroscience says that when we don't know something, our brain fills in the gap with right or wrong. Okay, so they have knowledge about the human body, right or wrong. It's your job to make sure that we're moving them Towards, some, towards the right. And also, you probably know the misconceptions that they already have, but you can teach them in the class so that's something you can clarify. Right. So. There's actually um, a whole online program designed at identifying misconceptions in science, um, and it is AAAS.org. It's AAAS.org, and it's great. It's great for, for everybody, K-12. K um, specifically, though, it, it ain't, it's aimed at identifying where you are with, with your misconceptions. Uh, and you can go on and create a free, free little profile. The kids can take a test. It's really fun to have the teachers take the test. Um, that's a whole lot of fun. Um, but we all have misconceptions. And misconceptions aren't bad. Misconceptions are a sign of growth, OK? Uh, and the, the, the thing is, is that you want to help them make the right connections beyond their misconception. Okay? So, to, to answer your question, pre-assessment, you got to spend time on that. All right? And for me in my classroom, if I'm pre-assessing and I have kids who aren't engaged in the pre-assessment, you know, I, I'm not going to give them a grade for, like, the percentage that they get right on the pre-assessment, right? Um, but I do need them to put some effort into it. My discussion with them is going to be, okay, you're going to do this pre-assessment. You may or may not know some of this stuff. The grade doesn't matter. What this is doing is helping me craft the class to tailor it to your needs. That way I don't bore you to tears with stuff that you already know. That way that we can spend more time on the good stuff. Spend more time, you know, in the case of science, doing the, doing the hands-on stuff that you want to do. Um, I'm doing less test preparation with you if I know where you are and you give me a truer sense of what you know. You give me your best effort on this. If you don't have that conversation with the kids, you know, then you're going to get the kids who give you the Christmas tree you know, or, or, or whatever. Um, it's, it's a funny story. Completely aside, uh, I was talking with one of the graphic arts teachers and she was saying that on her multiple choice tests at the end of the, the for the her exam, she actually had developed a pattern, like it was a graphic pattern, you know. So that her, her answers matched up. She said, "Flip the kids out." Uh, you know, I can imagine what some of the kids might give you as far as a graphic pattern, you know, on their <laughs> scantrons or whatever. But back to the point that that having that that data, you know. You got to do that, and you got to develop that relationship with them. If the kids know that you're working for them rather than against them, you're trying to help them, trying to move them along. You know, we got to remind the kids that we're doing that because it does get into that kind of us versus them kind of thing. It's the same way with with me, and and you guys are my students. I don't have a classroom anymore. It makes me very sad. All right, but I have to remind you constantly that I'm not here trying to make things harder for you. I'm trying to help. You know, and sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but that we're all in it together. So it goes back to relationships. It really does. Um, anyway, 
So this is an example of um, one of the tools that I absolutely love when it comes to data collection. All right, and this is Fluberoo. It's a Google extension, and I'm going to let the folks from Fluberoo explain it in a little bit here. Hey teachers, did you know that you can use Google Forms to give assignments and assessments to your students and faculty? And now with Fluberoo, you can quickly grade them too. For this demo of Fluberoo, I created a fake assignment as a Google Form, and I've submitted answers myself. All of the submissions were automatically inserted into the destination spreadsheet shown here. Now that I have all the submissions, I'd like to grade them, which is where Fluberoo comes in. Fluberoo is an add-on that you can install from right within the spreadsheet. At the same time in this demo, I've already pre-installed it. Once installed, you'll see a new menu called Fluberoo underneath the main add-ons menu. Let's select Great Assignment and see what happens. In step one, Fluberoo asks me to select the grading option for each question asked, such as if it's worth points, if it identifies a student like a name or an email address, or if it should be skipped. Bloomer will do its best to identify the correct option. Once I've correctly selected all grading options, I can click Continue to move on. In step two, Bloomer will ask me to identify which submission should be used as the answer key. Looking through them, I recognize the first one as the submission I made earlier, which I want to use as the answer key. Once selected, I can continue on with the grading. Once started, the grading should finish within under a minute. Great, it's done already. Now I can click on View Grades to see the result. Note that to report the grades, Fluberoo has created a new adjacent worksheet called Grades, seen here in the lower left. At the top of this worksheet is a summary of the grading, including the average score and other useful statistics. Beneath this are the grades themselves which include the total score expressed in both points and percent, the number of times this student made a submission, and of course, the score for each individual question, which in this case is either zero points or one. Also, for each question, the very last row shows the percent of students who got it correct. Questions on, this, on which less than 60% of the students got the right answer are highlighted in the Additionally, the names of the students will be in red font if they score less than 70% on the assignment. Besides grading, Fluberoo has other useful features as well. For example, Fluberoo can show you a report showing the distribution of grades, which you can email to yourself. Additionally, and most popularly, Fluberoo can email grades to each student. You'll have the option to include an answer key or not, as well as a personal message to include in the email. Thanks for watching. I hope Fluru can be helpful to you and your students. Please send comments or feedback to Dave at EdCode.com. Keep Fluberu. Okay, so <clears throat> Fluberu will be available to all of you once you created your Google. Uh, um, login, your Google profile. Uh, <clears throat> it runs through Sheets, which is the, the spreadsheet program. You create a form, which is a quiz, so the kids can access the quiz by um, using a QR code with the link on there. Um, you can give them, use the Google URL shortener to give them, you know, it's a, just a 12, 12 digit number that they enter in that takes them to the form. Um, it'll grade it for you. So you can get the reports. Uh, let me show you. Um, I've got a demo set up here. So you put your questions oh wait. In the form. You yeah, you put your questions in the form. What if you want to share, like, all like all chemistry people want to use this to sure. help divide and conquer? Sure. The, if you wanted to share, um, for those of you in YouTube land, wanted to share the uh, the forms, you can totally do that. Um, and Doing things like we're doing today, if I wanted to share with all of you the YouTube video from this presentation, it's two clicks away and everybody's got it. Same with the, um, with, with the forms, with 
spreadsheets with slide presentations is super easy to do that. Uh, so that is one of the, the big bonuses that we have. It's not, it doesn't require you to, to know anything about networking to be able to find the T drive and, you know, where, my T drive is not showing up anymore. Well, you just log in and, it, and your Google stuff and it's right there. All right. So th this is the, the one that I have that is a, uh, a sample. You can see the grades here. So this is my pre-assessment. I've done this very quickly. I, I can email it to the kids because the kids will have, all have their own Gmail accounts that are available to them. So they could take the quiz at home or on the bus or, you know, in the morning, in the library, wherever, uh, and then their results populate right away. I know which questions most of the kids missed because they're highlighted in orange. I know the students right away who have missed the most, uh, uh, who are less than 70% um, because they're highlighted in red. So that I can use those names right away to start forming my groups, right? I can start putting all of the kids um, that are less than 70 or whatever number you set it at, um, at, at in my pretest. I can set them as my group that I'm going to spend the most time working with. Then I can take and, and put the other kids in stations or whatever that allow them to work more independently because they've already mastered some of this stuff. You know, the, some of the kids are creating my infographic for me. You know, <clears throat> but this setup uh, with Fluberu uh, allows you to. to get some reports really, really quickly. Just even the summary allows you, you know, to, to figure out pretty, pretty quickly. All right, they had, you know, four questions and the average is, is 2.1. Well, that's not so great. You know what I mean? That, ooh, something's not right here. We, we need to go back and fix this if this is a post-test, you know, post-quiz or whatever. Um, you, can, you can see if this is a pre-test, you know, well, that's not too bad. They, you know, we're about halfway there. So then you can start drilling down a little deeper and figure out where you want to go. You can ta uh, tack in the, the standards to the questions, and, and it'll run a report based on the standards. So then you know exactly which standards you need to, uh, to highlight. Are elementary school students going to have a type of, I want to call it a dummy email, right. but it's... Yes, they will, they will have... A, um, Yes, that they will have a, 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 a Gmail profile, you know, for all of that type of stuff. They'll have access to all the, the tools and everything. Um, and it's my understanding that the student network will be internal, meaning that they can't email out. They can email each other. They can email, well, and that'll be monitored too. Um, yeah, because that that, that's, a, that's a concern. Uh, but there's a lot, lot to that. I, honestly, I have not had a whole lot of training yet on the Google domain and all of those kind of things because, you know, I haven't done it. So uh, we're getting there, but that's my understanding of, of where it is that they will have Google profile. They will have access to YouTube where they can upload um, privately, you know, and, and share the videos via link, or that they can upload to a folder, and then you can see it within there without actually having to go to YouTube. So there's lots of, of great ways, but it, it is de designed specifically to be SIPA compliant, so so that you know we're protected in, in that way, uh, and it's designed in a way that we can monitor what the kids are doing. All right, so um, that was Fluberu. Here's some of my other favorite uh, data collection uh, things. Uh, poll everywhere. If you go to a, a Braves game. And they, you want to know what song they're going to play at the seventh inning stretch? They they use poll everywhere, you know, and they put it up there. Text in your your you know your number to the song that you want to hear. Um, <clears throat> Socrative is one um, that we use. It's great because it's it's an app. It's also web based. Um, the only thing about Socrative is is buggy. Um, that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So part of that was our network, um, which thank goodness is holding up today. Um, um, so that's that's something great. It does give you extensive data management with with the um, Socrative, so you can do lots and lots of reports and get as detailed as you want, um, which is great. Poll everywhere. You have to pay in order to track individual student responses, but to do something quick in the class or PTO meeting, something where you don't have to know, you just want to know general consensus. Poll everywhere is the way to go for that one. Because it's, 
Now, you can do it for free as long as you're not tracking who responds to what. And you have up to, yeah, you have up to 40 free responses. Anything beyond 40, you'd have to pay for. Um, I love Infuse Learning. Um, Infuse Learning is like Socrative, except that it adds in an extra piece. My favorite part about it is that the students can draw their responses. So you think for kindergarten and first grade students who writing is, may not be possible, they can draw you a picture. Yeah. For chemistry teachers and physics teachers, it's fantastic because they can, they can actually show you the diagrams. Math teachers, they can show you their work by writing with their finger. Right? Um, Kahoot, I know you guys know Kahoot. All right. Uh, and then my last one here, and this is the one that I, I build in the, uh, the description of the session, um, is Plickers. Um, Plickers is uh, for the one device classroom where you want to collect student data quickly. And I'm going to show you a little video here of Plickers. my polished uh, presentation style, you can tell. Okay, so what you just saw was uh, the teacher had their iPad, whatever that was, with the Plickers app preloaded on it. The kids all had Plicker cards that were printed out, and basically that card had what, um, like a QR code, um, but what you couldn't see is that in the card, um, around the, the outside of the card, around the outside of the dark shape, there were, there were letters and numbers. So if the kids want to respond one or A, they hold it one way. If they want to respond B or two, they turn the card so that B or two is on the top and, and so on and so forth. And so then all they do is they hold it up and you take your device, sweep it across the classroom, you notice that it recognized not only the card, but the, the student names, it collected their response and it dumped it into a, a, a spreadsheet that gave you live data. Um, super easy, free, right? The cards, I will tell you this trick, that the cards, you're going to, you think, well, they need to last a long time, so I need to laminate them. All right, don't laminate them. Um, uh, unless you have the, the matte finished laminating, um, because the glossy stuff, yeah, you, the glare will keep them from, from doing it. And you can train the kids to hold them up flat. Um, and you have to you have to train them because they'll, you know, waving their arms around. Uh, but anyway, let's see. Can I move on now? Hmm. All right, my. That was quick response. Oh, it's my laptop. It is tired. Like the operator. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. All right, let's see if it'll reboot for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the one good thing about going to Google is that this stuff is much less likely to happen. I don't know if you guys know, but with the Chromebooks, um, Mr. McMichael back there in the back has one that he absolutely loves. You can see it goes with him everywhere. Um, the, the Chromebooks 
don't run anything else except the Chrome uh, web browser. It's the only thing that they run. That's the only thing they're designed to run. So you don't have to worry about other programs interfering with your web browser. And since everything that we're going to be doing is web-based, it's super duper fast. You're going to love that. And that this stuff doesn't happen because your computer doesn't get tired on you and decide to quit working. Get back to where it was. Okay, so now you got the um, your data, and we showed you different ways to collect it. They're, they're easy. Now, what do you do with them? You got to put them in groups, okay? And when you put them in groups, that, that doesn't mean that you can paint all the smart kids green and put them over in the corner, right? And paint all the slow kids red and put them over in the other corner. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about groups. The kids figure it out, right? So we got to kind of be surreptitious on, on our groups and keep them from, from figuring out who's where. So the way that I do that is I um, use QR codes and URL shorteners. And I'm going to show you an example here in a second. My favorite uh, URL shortener is Bitly. All right. Um, and my favorite uh, QR code generator is QR stuff. Um, it's a whole lot of fun. QR codes are fantastic. You can go and put logos in your QR code, make them colors, put them on t-shirts, right? Put them randomly across the building. You know, if you've got a club or something like that, just make a QR code to that club's website and just stick the QR code, a naked QR code with nothing else around it, and the kids will walk up to it and be like, and they'll scan it just, just for, to scan it. I'm going to show you an example of a, a lesson um, that I've uh, created, and it's just, this is a model, meaning that I, I'm less concerned about the content and more concerned about the approach, okay, the pedagogy, if you will. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a cloning thing, and, and this is a scenario. Um, this would be like in my life science class. Um, we're going to talk about Spot the dog, okay? And we have the Cleaver family. There, there's Grace, there's Jack, and there's Ralphie Cleaver. And we tell the students the viewpoints of each of the, the uh, characters here. Uh, and that, like Grace, she's 45 years old. She's a volunteer Sunday school coordinator. And um, she does not condone cloning at all. Uh, well, her son, Ralphie, is an honor roll student. You know, thinks he knows everything, right? And wants to clone Spot the dog because Spot is old and dying. Um, Jack Cleaver is the, the dad. Um, uh, he's got a degree in biology, um, but he's caught in the middle between his wife and his son and his love for Spot the dog, okay? So now we've created the scenario. We've given the viewpoints. Now we're going to split the kids off into groups. Uh, and this is what their worksheet is going to look like. You can't read the questions very well because it's a screenshot, but I'm going to tell you what, it, what this is. All right, the, there are six questions on each piece of uh, each section of this uh, piece of paper. I would cut them in, into thirds, right? One group, um, the group on the top is going to be the Grace group, the mama. The one in the middle is the Jack group, the daddy. And the one at the bottom is the Ralphie group, the son. These are differentiated by reading level. The link and the QR code take the students to websites that talk about cloning. The students are all answering the same questions related to cloning, but they're differentiated based on the student's reading level. So that, you know, one of them's at the Washington Post, the other one as, is at... Uh, um, uh, GPTV cloning website. So I think the reading level goes from about, um, in this case, it's about third grade up to about uh, eighth grade. Okay, just so you have a rough idea about where that is. The great thing about this is, is that when I wrote the questions, you know, there are questions that each group has the most detail on. 
so that your lower reading level group isn't the one that doesn't know the answers. They know stuff that the other kids don't and vice versa. So it gives everybody a chance to participate. If you give those lower level kids the opportunity to shine in the classroom, it makes a big difference. Okay. But putting the QR codes and, and the um, URL shorteners there, there, you can't tell the difference between these, these groups just by looking at them. And that's what we want. Um, you can use Google to sort by reading level, sort the searches by reading level. And it gives you basic, middle, and high. Um, if you use Destiny, and in Destiny, there's WebPath Express. If you don't know what that is, go have a conversation with your media specialist. Um, it can sort by actual Lexile number. All right? And the great thing about Destiny, too, is that the, the websites are vetted. There's no junk associated with them, no pop-up ads, no girls in bikinis, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, one of my other favorite resources is Newzella. Newzella um, uh, provides you websites that you can change the Lexile on uh, immediately. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is about the passenger business because we're talking about uh, cloning. Right. So Jurassic Park for birds. Um, and if Ross Geller were here, you know, he would say no way that this could happen. Right. No, no friend reference. No friends. It's after lunch. You guys are tired. I, yeah, I get it. You'll notice over here on the right-hand side that there's that blue bar, and it's got Lexile levels attached to it. You can click on the button, and it takes you to a different website that looks exactly the same, except for the reading level of the text has changed. Same pictures, same graphs, same information, just at different reading levels. And you can do it on the fly. You can give your kids the link directly to the 940 Lexile level article. I could give a group over here in the corner, the 940, the a group over here, the 1100, and, and nobody knows the difference. We're all talking about the same things. But we're all able to contribute to the conversation because we're all able to comprehend it. You can go in and create an account here. It's free um, for most of the services. Uh, and you can tailor it to your grade level so that you get things that are grade appropriate, reading level appropriate for you. It doesn't, uh, I haven't experienced it a whole lot. Uh, I just realized that I was showing my crotch to the all of YouTube there. Um, <laughs> something else you have to think about when you're, when you're doing this type of stuff. Um, hi, YouTube. All right. so. Um, you can, I haven't seen it go down um, really low, like for kindergarten, first grade. Um, and, and Lisa, have you used New Zealand? The lowest, I, yeah, I do. I call it New Zealand. Whatever. Um, the lowest I've seen it go is like a 640. Okay. I don't think I've seen it go any lower than that. But your tests are left filed, um, your writing works. I mean, it's great. Yeah, it does provide um, quizzes for you. It does, um, like, you know, Super Bowl, the Super Bowl was one of the things. Um, if you, across the top, uh, you'll see the different um, areas that you talk about. Um, the one thing that I like about it is that these are all things that kids will get emotional about. And I don't mean that they're going to cry on you, but that they'll, they'll get engaged with it. And that's what we're looking for. That's where we pull the kids in, is when we get them emotional, right? So um, let's go on to the, to the next one here. Go back to my presentation. Um, seriously, they go talk to your uh, media specialist about Destiny. There's so many tools in Destiny that we're not aware of. Um, it, it really is fantastic. Uh, and your media specialist would love to, love to talk to you about it. Yes. Those of you in YouTube land, my wife walked in, the, the media specialist. Um, that has nothing to do with the timing of my plug there either. <clears throat> but when you put them in groups, um, one of the things that um, in my conversations with business leaders in Coweta County has been that their employees have trouble working in groups. 
and that nobody works by themselves. They all work as part of a team, all that type of stuff. Well, how often do you teach your kids to work in groups? Right? We put them in groups, and we say, go, work in a group. And y'all know, uh, y'all being smart people, when, you know, in college when you did group work, you just roll your eyes because you knew that you were going to be the one doing all the work and everybody else was going to sponge off of you, right? Am I lying? Well, we've got to teach the kids how to work in groups. And, and assigning them roles within a group is a good way to do that. So um, you can use services like Screencast-O-Matic to create a tutorial. So you have someone who is a tutorial designer, a how-to, right? Um, you can have the scribe. Um, and if you are working within Google Docs, you can create a document that you can share and that everyone can contribute to live. And you can see, okay, Leanne has commented here in red. Amanda has commented in yellow. Donald has commented in green. And we know exactly who said what and when they said it and exactly who contributed what. Isn't that one of the hardest parts about group work is figuring out who did what? You know, that's one of the hardest parts about grading science fairs. Did the parents do it or did the kids do it? Most of the time it's pretty obvious, parents. Parents. All right. Um, another thing, I, um, I, my wife and I were talking about using videos in the classroom. And that videos, uh, you know, have a tendency to get abused in the classroom or that the kids get disengaged from them. One of the things you can do is have what they call a back channel conversation. And what that is, is, is you create a Google Doc or you can use a service like Padlet or some of those kind of things where it allows folks to contribute all at the same time. Um, and you can post questions on the Google Doc and the kids respond as they pop up in the video. Um, kids in my class, when I did videos, they didn't like it because I would stop the video and make them talk about what they were watching. You know, I would show them things in classroom like um, uh, Deep Impact. You guys remember the movie about the comment, you know, all that type of stuff. The kids could not watch the movie because I'm stopping and we're talking about it and we're talking about, you know, all the things that are going on and what, how this relates to what we're studying. They didn't like movie days in my class, okay? Um, you got the Google Jockey. Um, if you've seen some of the talk shows that they have now, like on uh, ESPN, there's a, um, a show, um, Pardon the Interruption, and at the end of the show, the two commentators go to their Google Jockey guy who is confirming what they have said all along, and he's a, like a fact checker. And so, you know, we'd be doing this when we run across and somebody has a question, you know, uh, what's a, a carrier pigeon or, or whatever? And I'd say, Stan, Google Jockey, find out, you know, find us some references on carrier pigeons. And they go off and, and do the research. Um, the gatekeeper creates exit questions or next, next steps. That's a great one for the kids who are the creative thinkers, you know, get them, get them in, involved. You could have someone create a review podcast. So you've got your Google Doc with kind of a transcript of what's been going on in there. And then you have your person whose job it is to create the podcast that you can go back and listen to later off of those notes. Does that make sense? What I'm talking about there? Okay. So here are my parting shots. This is from, pardon the interruption. Um, <clears throat> not everything has to be differentiated because that that's the overwhelming fear that our teachers have when it comes to differentiation is the, the thought that everything has to be differentiated and it doesn't. The thing is, is it needs to happen and happen often but it doesn't have to happen every day and every assignment. All right, It should be driven by the student needs. If you do pre-assessment and you determine that everybody's right where, about where they need to be, then you don't differentiate. Everybody can move together doing the exact same thing. That happens, right? Folks come into Mary Grace's human anatomy class. They all know something about the lungs. So she's got them ready to go, and they can all start together, okay? She didn't have to differentiate for those who know more or less about the lungs. You follow me on that? Um, 
it should be almost invisible. A lot of the things that you see out there, um, like teacher-created materials, is a um, they're a, a producer of like worksheets, workbooks, those kind of things. I have you know all kinds of great stuff. They're great, uh, but their tiered work will have like a star in the upper right-hand corner for tier one. For tier two, it'll have a square. Tier three, it'll have a circle. You know that way it makes it invisible to the students, but it's easily, you know, easy for you to assess because you know the code, right? Or same with the QR codes that I showed you before. You know that Ralphie is, is the, that's the lower reading group, and you know that Grace is the higher reading group. But the students don't know it, right? And the other thing is, is the administrators, when they come into the room, you know, they're going to see kids doing different things, right? You know, they may look like they're all working on the same you know document like my cloning lesson but you know that I differentiated based on student ability with that reading level make a note in your, your lesson plan you know differentiated by readability you know sometimes the kids are going to be working on different products they're going to be working on different things you and that's, those are much easier for, for the administrators to see. I can tell you guys with our GAPS visits, that's one of the things where we struggle the most, trying to assess differentiation. Because some schools do it so well, it's invisible. And people say, well, I didn't see it. And we're like, whoa, 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 did you go back? Did you talk to the teacher? Did you see it in the lesson? Did you look at the lesson plans? Did you talk to the kids about, you know, how they change groups from day to day? You know, well, today's Tuesday, so I'm in this group, you know, and, we're flex grouping and you know all that stuff that's we struggle with that recognizing it because it's supposed to be invisible okay so anyway um, thank you guys for attending today thank you for being part of our YouTube uh, streaming session uh, by YouTube uh, you guys enjoy the rest of the session we'll see you see you later okay